All right then guys, welcome to the video, welcome back to the channel, and today is a incredibly exciting one because as you can see, we have an EP3 here, but we also have Julian, and I, I'm gonna do a terrible, terrible introduction of you, so please introduce yourself to everyone. I'm Julian Thompson, I'm a car designer, I've been a car designer for all my career. I've worked at Ford, Volkswagen Audi, Lotus, Jaguar Land Rover, and at the moment I work for General Motors. Over the course of the years, I've done many cars, but I was actually involved in this car many years ago, back in about sort of mid nineties. It was a time when I worked at Lotus, but Lotus also used to do a lot of um, consultancy work for various manufacturers, mainly for engineering, but also design. And we did work for BMW, Opel, Saab, Nissan, um, all sorts of different companies, and Honda in Frankfurt, as it were. So the reason this is so interesting is because your design over the years got fettled a bit, but basically your original design was the one that got chosen to become what is the EP3 Type R, or like the three-door shape for the EP3, yeah. is that correct? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, in, in the world of car design, for any uh, major vehicle, you get lots and lots of proposals. You, get, you know, it's a bit like the X Factor. You get lots and lots of designers all doing sketches, then models, and then full-size models, and it whittled down to one. Most organizations, they have several design studios across the world. So Honda, for instance, had a studio in Tokyo, um, probably two studios in Tokyo. They had a, a studio in California, a studio in Frankfurt, and each one of those studios, every time a model comes along, they'd do sketches, designs, models, and they'd all go into a big melting pot and gradually get whittled down to one, one design. So at the time, in the mid-90s, Honda Frankfurt was a client of ours, so we did lots and lots of work on various Honda models, be it Accord, Civic, even NSX after I left, actually. You know, we'd do lots and lots of sketches, we'd jump on a plane, go out to Offenbach, Frankfurt, present our drawings, have a discussion about them. They take us out for a nice Thai meal, get on a plane back to Norwich. And we did that, you know, over the course of several weeks, we'd, we'd progress our designs. I didn't realize at the time, we did, we did lots of work for a three-door Civic at the time, would have been about, I think about 95, 96, something like that. As you appreciate, you do a scale model and it doesn't appear in design for another maybe four or five years. Right. And they can come out fundamentally the same, but not quite the same, you know? And I didn't even realize until much later that our car had actually got chosen. Um, while I was working at Jaguar as uh, the advanced design director there, I hired a designer called Sandy. He used to be working at Offenbach. And he said, oh, your model got chosen and sent out to Tokyo and, and transpired it went into the real thing. So yeah, so that's, that's my little part in the EP3. That is so cool. And so once you found that out, decided to pick one up, I guess. So I've always said to my designers, it's a great privilege you actually can drive a car you've designed. And also, you know, to have the, the uh, courage of convictions actually say, you know, drive what you design is a really, it's just something you should be able to do, you know? And I've always said that to my designers, you know, if you design that car, you ought to go out and buy one and get one. And that works if you design a cool car, that's all right. <laughs> I've got friends who, uh, one of my friends designed the, the Citroen Plurial, as for instance, and he hasn't bought one. Another one who designed the Metro Cab Taxi, he certainly doesn't want one. Ian Callum, my boss, he, he went out and bought an Aston Martin Vanquish because uh, he designed that. I have an Elise because I designed the Elise and I, and I also have an Honda EP3. There's a couple of the cars I designed. That's so cool. I think before we have a quick look around this car, should we have a look at the design sketchbook that you've brought with you? So yeah, sure, absolutely. Walk through that. Absolutely. Now, this uh, magazine is called Car Styling, and this is for car designers. This is the Bible uh, of recording stories about car design. And, you know, as a student, as, as a designer, this is a thing you always refer to. And when you design a car, you'd send all your stories and pictures it through to Japan, and they'd, even if it wasn't, you know, not just Japanese cars, but all cars, you'd send it through to this magazine and the publisher. This one has the story of the uh, Honda Civic and uh, it's November 2000 and it just shows the process you'd go through. This is the Honda Civic sketches. So you do sketches like this, this is the sort of thing we'd do, but below that you'll see lots and lots of different full size and scale models of the Honda proposals. And you leave, read the text here, some of them are from Honda Europe, some of them from Honda Japan, some are from California, and you detail the story. So we would have taken part in this sort of exercise, sketches first, then little models and, and the winning ones would have been sent back to Tokyo and, and over the course of years, as I say, would be made into a real thing. So this is, you know, this is how it all started. And, um, you know, this is the only record I've got of this. I have got some drawings of, the, of, the, of our original Honda somewhere and I've asked Russell Carr at Lotus to 
send them through to me, whether he will or not, we'll wait and see. So that design book is really interesting, but what is the design process for you? Yeah, I mean, pretty much every car uh, takes about four or five years to design. Wow. You start by just doing lots and lots of sketches and ideas, and a lot of Japanese companies, they, they had a very strange technique of developing cars, and they, they all, they'd like to start with a character or a word. Certainly the Jazz was, was based around the word Samba. They d developed this whole notion about what the car stood about, what, what was Samba. And that's what they tell the marketing people, the engineering people, and designers. I'm we're trying to create Samba. You know, for that, so I can't remember what it was for this car. But people start drawing and sketching. There's some very rational things, obviously, you know, what the engine is and what the, the underneath the car is and the rest of it. And they've got some criteria that, you know, they want the car to get bigger, more roomy, etc., etc. But it's really up to the designers at that stage to start drawing and sketching. And that's probably about four or five years before the actual car appears in production. And then um, we'd go on to, back in those days, it would be scale models created by hand. These days it'd all be done on uh, CAD, and you'd, but you still have a mixture of CAD and scale models, and then you eventually get a full size. But going from sketch to full size clay proposal would take about between one and a half and two years. Wow. And then it's about two years to actually take that, that model of all its engineering data and put it into production. The final year being making all the tooling and, and um, setting up the factories. It's a long process. It takes a long, long process. So that, that's why we always get really annoyed when people, we bring out a car, and someone else brings out another car six months later and they say, well, it's a copy of that one. We say, well, it can't be, because it both started four or five years ago. But it's, it's a very long process. It always has been. Technology tries to make cars development quicker, but at the same time, they're getting much more complex. So they're, they're more difficult to make. So, you know, that's, that's a process we followed with this. For all cars then, it's pretty much that same. So this, it, was, it would have been the same length of time in designing yeah, this. Yeah, absolutely. So. I mean, for this one, they would have been doing the five door at the same time. We didn't do any, the five door didn't, you know, obviously a different, what we call a different top hat, different body shell. So that wouldn't have been done independently, but they'd be looking at all the sharing of different componentry. In my career as a designer, I dance around and do lots of different cars and different jobs. Honda in Japan, I remember I talked to one of their designers and I said, how long have you been working at Honda? And he said, oh, um, 25 years. I said, oh yeah, what cars do you work on? He said, just Civic. I said, yeah, just Civic. He said, yeah, just three-door Civic. I said, just the three-door Civic. He said, uh, rear compartment. So he, all he did for all his career was just the rear compartment of a Honda Civic three-door. And that's why, you know, that's why the quality in these cars is so good because so this poor designer, that's all he did was rear compartment of three-door Civic. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously he can manage to refine it and get it better and better and better. In Europe, you know, the designers are, are much freer to dance around and I think probably are back in Honda as well now. But it's um, back then they're very, very prescriptive about how they did it. Always a continuous improvement and quality was so important. That's how they used to design cars back then. Yeah, so Julian, this car, what from your design actually made it into the final car? Yeah, I mean, I think this car was actually pretty revolutionary at the time, because if you think this is an era when you would have got things like Renault Clio, Ford Fiesta, Peugeot 205, and they would have been very much, you know, um, conventional bonnet, quite upright screen, and, you know, very, very similar profile. So in terms of proportion of this car, you know, which has got this very, very screen very, very far forward, and very, very angled. You know, this is very modern now. You see a lot of small cars this size now, following this direction. And you know, the, the A pillar of this car is really, really far forward. If you look at how it is, you know, if you compare that with the Fiesta of the mid nineties, uh, 2000s, very, very conventional. So this car was really, really revolutionary. In terms of what we were given as a brief on this car, Honda did lots of stuff with this sort of bread van profile. You remember things like the Aero deck on the Accord and things like that. And all those cars, a lot of sort of blunt ends. And they always wanted to have a really big cabin. You know, this, this car has got an exceptionally big cabin for what, what else was around at the time. And I think as car designers, we always like to do, you know, very angled screen, very angled bonnets, almost a continuous line between here and here, going all the way forward. And we'd like to put the wheels at each corner so the car is really planted. And we have, like to have a little bit of what we call co Coke bottle, and so the wheels stick out a little bit. And Honda really sort of encompassed that. And um, that was very much from our initial scale models, had this almost what we call a, rather than a, a one and a half box shape, almost like a one box shape, like a continuous form. The car is just like one shape and very, very modern at this time. And then in terms of how we sort of subtly enhance that to stop it looking like a van, 
you'll notice that the car's got loads and loads of taper here and tucks around to the back and it's really really tapered in the world which is a very modern thing for its era as well in its time you get a fiesta at this time it's really boxy at the back really really modern a vertical screen up here obviously this spoiler is a really cool thing as well you may notice that the jaguar i pace which i also worked on has got a spoiler very similar to this because i was inspired by this but that's another story i'm still very proud of this design i think it looks very very modern still and you know you see these driving around compared to what else was around at the time. It's a, it's a very, very striking car. And the interior space is, is humongous compared to other cars of its time, which is not something designers normally used to like to boast about. But I think it's the one box profile which is so important, which has been um, copied by so many other cars. I think also, which is really nice, is this car's got really clean body sides. So you look at a lot of cars of this era as well, they've got lots of creases and shapes and like that, but this big clean door you know, it's very similar to you on a Porsche 911. You know, it really doesn't need to shout about it. It doesn't need lots of light lines and funky things going on. That's very, very important. And at the front of the car, obviously this sort of shovel nose and the way the car tapers at the front and the, how the corners are really swept in, the lights are really integrated. They're not just marking out the corners is really, again, for its time, a very, very modern feature. So I still think the car, you know, has stood the test of time really well. I'm very, very proud of, of what my team did to influence uh, this design. So you obviously have the FL5 Type R now, and you obviously own this EP3, so you must love a hot hatch. Yeah, and before that we had an FK8 as well. So I do like the Hondas, but I, I've very much grown up with hot hatches. My first car was an Alpha Sud Ti, which is obviously one of the earliest hot hatches. Then I had a Fiat 127 Coupe, a Golf GTI, XR2, Renault 5 Turbo GT. And then as I grew up, I got into, you know, more grown up cars. And when I worked at Jaguar, then I had lots of real sort of big comfy armchair cars like XKs and XJs, but I really always missed the uh, driver involvement of, of front wheel drive hot hatches. First car I got to rekindle that was, was this one. Since then I've, I've, I've uh, got a Clio Trophy as well, Clio 182 Trophy. I was really into all that Evo magazine stuff as well. So I've also got a Lotus at least 160 Sport and uh, Subaru Impreza RB5. So cars of that era around sort of 2000 and, and those really sort of cars which are really about driver involvement. So many stories you can tell behind all those all those vehicles and excitement to find is, is really, you know, the generation cars I really like. And you know, that Honda, that one over there, everyone knows it's by far the best hot hatchback ever. And it probably will be f forever for your transition to electric. So it's a, I think that's a very important car to have and pick a nice pairing with this one here. Yeah, it's nice that you've also got two in black. Yeah, absolutely. It's a nice little combo. Absolutely. So let's talk about this very car then. What is the story behind you getting this? And obviously it's got some modifications. So yeah, what can you tell us about this? Actually, I mean, I started looking for it. I didn't look very far for it. You know, I tend to buy the first car I see. And this one, I went down, had a look at it. It was advertised an auto trader. And I rang a doorbell and it was sort of, Darren, Darren, someone's at the door for you. And this sort of chavvy kid came out, baseball back cap back at the front. And he'd done loads of modifications to this car. I think it was it was very, very noisy and undrivable. What he had done very nicely was he had resprayed the whole car in Bentley black metallic and the quality of the bodywork and the paint is actually very good. So that's the thing that drove me uh, towards it. It had all sorts of modifications on it. I took it down to Honda and they put it up on their ramps and they went up saying, that's quite good, that's shit, that's shit, that's quite good, that's shit. And I went through the whole car. And so they've modified it consequently as well. It's got a quaff differential, it's got eight piston brakes or something, is it? <laughs> right, it's got coilovers, boost over exhaust, racing clutch. It's been set up by uh, Gravity, uh, the race car shop. So various bits and pieces. It obviously had a boot full of amplifiers and speakers and all that sort of stuff, which I took out. It's a pretty good track car, but it's a pretty horrendous road car, if I'm honest. You know, it is, it is so rigid. It's very, very grippy and uh, it's pretty fast, but it's it's just, as a road car, it's just so non-compliant that it's it's very, very tough. But as a track car, it's very good. I've never actually driven a standard EP3, so I've got nothing to compare it against. It's pretty good fun and we do various track days and hill climbs of it. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a fun car. It's definitely interesting that you've never driven the standard car to actually know I suppose what your vision of the car when you were designing it would end up actually becoming. Maybe that should be a future video guys if anyone's got a standard EP3 let me know and we can potentially arrange something in the future because I think that would be really interesting as well. You don't drive this too often I suppose. Do you actually bring it out for any 
day-to-day -day, like drives or is it literally just this is your track car and that's pretty much it's all you track car and i've been very busy in the last year setting up a new design operation so haven't had so much time no we do have a lot of fun of it i'm not sure exactly what to do with it because that one obviously the new one is quite a bit better i don't know i have a fondness of it and it's very difficult to to uh, think what to do with the car and how long to keep it i've got far too many cars and you know we need to, to thin them out at some point but we'll see what i do with it it's um it's a nice example and it's uh not going anywhere, so I think it's fine. So guys, this has been incredibly interesting. So thank you very much, Julian, for your time today. Pleasure. And is there any way people can follow you? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm Julian Thompson Design on Instagram. They won't do that. I can't promise too much on this stuff, but we'll see. Well, yeah. So <laughs> this is a really interesting insight into the design process and the fact that we even met, I think, was just such a crazy moment because the reason this has even happened is we were at Caffeine and Machine and just had like a EP3 little meet and uh, Julian had come down. I think you were in your Ferrari that day. Yeah, I was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, not in this. And just wanders over and is just looking at the cars and that's how we ended up talking. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah, it's absolutely. amazing what the car world can do and the people it can bring together so yeah i just want to say thank you very much yeah, julian, for yeah, doing nice the video you, yeah, and absolutely. let me know guys do you want to see some more stuff with julian in the future there's obviously more cars and more stories to be told but that's going to do it for this one guys so hopefully you've enjoyed this one don't forget to comment down below what you think also subscribe to the channel like this one and i'll catch you guys in the next one